It's really nice to present here in the interspace. As was mentioned before, that's how 2020 should look like. On the other side, this is not how 2020 should look like. <laughs> so I think like that's what currently on everybody's mind, uh, for sure, on kind of ours. And like, it does not look like the virus spreading stops anytime soon, uh, which obviously means there's, you know, loss of life, but also there's a lot of other repercussions that will come in and just wanted to kind of talk through what does this mean for both like economics in general as kind of I see it, but also how crypto can come in, where are we lacking and open a discussion to talk more about um, like, what can we do? Um, so just kind of to start off, like what does this crisis really mean on the economic side? Like right now, there's a huge demand shock that happens across all of the industries, uh, especially this is true for travel, leisure, hospitality, events, retail. There's uh, Open Table uh, publishes like state of uh, industry and pretty much like there's no reservations for restaurants in any of the countries uh, globally. The obviously travel is pretty much stalled. Airlines are going out of business. Uh, events are canceled and with all that, there's a huge supply chain comes in as well. Uh, so if we talk about, you know, events, there's like a huge set of contractors and, uh, kind of delivery and catering and all kinds of things coming in that also don't have a, uh, kind of demand for their services. Um, this really kind of flips into a huge unemployment crisis and, uh, so kind of uh, March 31st, the labor statistics published U.S. unemployment rates. Uh, there's about plus 6 million people that filed for unemployment in March. Uh, and it's expected about like another 10 million in April. This is just in U.S. This is uh, pretty much um, like 5% of population uh, going unemployed. This is also like only full-time workers contractors and gig economy is not actually accounted for at least right now there's a bill uh in progress to kind of uh, change that but like right now you know if if you're an uber driver and you're not driving because there's no demand anymore uh you're actually not eligible for unemployment so we don't actually have a visibility into that uh you europe had at least 1 million people last week and in general worldwide i think international labor organization said about 36 million people uh, going unemployed. So it's a huge, massive crisis and, uh, kind of high level, right? This means that like, there's a lot of businesses strapped for cash because there is no demand, uh, from the consumer, at least in the short term, which means like a lot of businesses, which are cash heavy, like cash flow heavy and don't have huge, uh, resources are contracting. Also all of the like retail brick and mortar stores, which have e-commerce or primarily e-commerce are closing their stores as well. So again, it's like a huge crisis and like there's a lot of people who can be kind of suffering from this. And we're really, like, I'm really interested how can we help as an industry, especially with this. So this is kind of hard to see, um, but uh, this is previous crisis uh, across three countries that I wanted to highlight. So this is United States uh, here at the top, uh, top right. So we have United States, which had a 4.6% unemployment rate in 2007, and it spiked up almost to 10% after the 2000, uh, like the economic crisis in 2008. Notice that like there was like, a huge lag as well on the crisis. So even though the crisis happened 2007, 2008, the peak only happened in 2010. And then from there, it started lowering back again as economic and the economy recovered. Uh, second country we wanted to show is Italy. So this is uh, in the bottom uh, left. Uh, so we have very interesting point, which uh, Italy's economy was doing pretty poorly in end of two, uh, 90s and then improved up to 2007 again and had a huge hit uh, after the crisis in US, right? 
So the crisis in 2008 is purely like U.S. economy failing, but there's this state, there's this uh, phrase when U.S. economy is uh, all global economy catches the flu. So this is an example where pretty much uh, in Italy, there's a huge spike in unemployment and it's actually didn't even recover since then. Uh, and obviously we know what's going on with Italy now. So like Italy will be hurting a lot um, in the upcoming months and years. And so Ukraine, I'm, I'm originally from Ukraine. And so I'm, I'm kind of lived through this uh, specifically in 2008. There was a huge, like Ukraine being in crisis all the time. Uh, it's not kind of the best country, uh, but uh, specifically same thing happened in 2007, kind of eight, there's a spike from the, uh, from the crisis kind of uh, as a lagging. And then uh, the other spike that happened is actually like revolution and wars that have that been happening in Ukraine. But the point is that I want to make is uh, like economy in you, like as US kind of has issues, it propagates across economy. In this case, we have issues everywhere. So the interesting thing here is that actually the crisis in US leads to a bigger demand in dollars in other countries. So as things like uh, financial crisis happened, uh, so here on the top, we have a uh, USD to Grivna, to Ukrainian currency Grivna uh, exchange rate chart. And Grivna is actually has a, uh, it's a soft peg to dollar, meaning that central bank is like Ukrainian central bank is trying to keep a uh, kind of stable exchange rate until like while they can uh, to, to dollar. So, and we see like from the start, right, uh, like every bump has been some kind of crisis, either internal or external. Uh, so in case of like first few bumps, that was internal crises. Uh, in 2008, we see the external crisis that led to from like uh, five to eight. And then uh, the revolution and kind of all the wars as internal crisis led to even huge, like increase from eight to almost 27, 28. Uh, grievance per dollar. So this just shows that like there's actually a huge demand in dollars in other countries, even as dollar itself is in turmoil. So same kind of uh, in Argentina peso, it's like it doesn't actually have a bump in 2008, but it has a huge like demand on dollar uh, in the uh, like in the last years as they had been like huge crisis internally for Argentina. Uh, the, the kind of the other side of it is actually all the central banks have reserves in, in uh, US dollars as well. And all the international like banking loans are also paid back in dollars, which means like as if the country has taken a loan, which in the case of Ukraine, there's been a lot of loans from IMF, they actually need to buy dollars to pay back interest. So like there's a huge demand on all of those countries to get dollars as uh, as a central banks as well to pay back on interest and everything. So in general, dollar is a huge majority of the uh, kind of reserves that central banks across the world have. So this is a allocation of uh, different currencies in central banks around the world uh, with USD having like 62 or something, 65% uh, and Euro taking another uh, 25. So this just shows like how important dollar is for economy. And even though like we know that uh, there will be a huge, you know, quantitative easing, there will be a lot of dollars printed uh, by US government. The thing is like, there's so much demand around the world that it actually probably actually will keep dollars like strong or even make it stronger just because there's actually at the same time inflation everywhere else, right? China just, uh, uh, announced 1.2 trillion RMB printed. Uh, Europe uh, will uh, pretty much also provide in euro. And uh, so, like in previous crises, when these things happen, all of those countries actually create a demand for dollar. And additionally, the country itself tries to control capital around around that. Right. So in Ukraine, for example, an export company would need to sell 50% of its uh, of its dollars received, uh, 
like without being able to even keep the kind of uh, revenues that it's receiving in the currency it's receiving in. Argentinian peso, right? Like a you know half a like two months, three months ago, on a street would be trading 10, 20 percent uh, up from the uh, up from the kind of official price that banks are posting. I'm just like checking if you guys are still here. <laughs> We're here. We're here. We're on here. Yes. Um, so China, like China, is also has a huge deficit of uh, dollars. So like, are usually uh, it's like one two percent on top of the usual price. So like, I've seen it from USDT being trading like at a at a premium uh, because like you cannot actually get dollars to you know put it in Bitfinex and get USDT. You actually need to like somebody need to get USDT and, and willing to take RMB and they want a, a premium on that. Uh, Venezuela, which, you know, everybody's talking about Bitcoin being used in Venezuela, actually mo mo most of the time wants to use dollars as well. So there's this interesting scheme where um, like relatives and friends of people who live in Venezuela open a Chase account for them and gives them login and password. And this way, Venezuelans can actually send each other money in Chase Quick Pay, which is like zero transaction fee, uh, was in Chase uh, and transacting dollars, right? So it's like a very weird way of like going around the capital controls and like transaction uh, and like actually being able to transact in dollars. And so I'm sure there's more of these things that I'm not aware of, but like this is kind of just a few things that I'm closely being closely uh, monitoring. So. So on the other side, we have gold, right? And like gold, everybody pretty much think of, of, of some decorrelated asset that uh, can be used as reserve. And it is used as reserve, right? Like a lot of countries actually have uh, huge reserves of gold uh, stored. So United States actually have almost like over 8,000 to tons of gold stored in its reserve, uh, which is like more than like next three countries combined. Um, and the interesting thing, like of the total kind of gold stock in, in, uh, that's been like mined, uh, since the beginning, right. O almost a half of it is in jewelry. So like most, almost a half of it is not like actually, uh, like used as any kind of currency about 17% used as a reserve, uh, 14% used in industry. So it's used a lot in obviously electronics, uh, but also there's like other usages. And then 21% is used in kind of investment and uh, like comprise of ETFs and everything. The interesting part is gold is not usually tr like, you don't usually move gold and like trade it, right? It's, uh, you usually trade on futures and options uh, and ETFs. And the reality is it's like so hard to transport. It's so heavy. It's really hard to use as measure of count because you don't want to like split it and, you know, like you, you only want to kind of like you. All, it's almost non fungible tokens in a way because like every you know bullion or every break of gold really is just like a, an item that you know you you want to trade because you actually also need to transport it. You need like you cannot like if you start if you start splitting them, it creates a lot of like additional accounting that you need to track, etc. So even though gold is like in theory can be like the asset that like people rely on, in practice it's just unusable as as such. Uh, and like it, originally dollar being the, you know, gold, gold, gold peg, like is, was allowing to, you know, have something that's like fungible and usable while, uh, being backed by gold. Uh, obviously since then, like the, you know, the peg was just like disbanded, but the idea is like, unless it's something that's like a, a currency that backed by gold, the gold itself is just unusable as a currency. So one more thing I want to mention is like, as like, there is a lot of like pretty much Europe, US, China, and I'm sure other countries will be issuing uh, pretty much loans to small businesses to kind of help uh, and like bridge this uh, state of economy where like all of these businesses are closed and there is no uh, cash flow. Uh, so. US announced like 350 billion for small businesses. So they just opened that thing up on Friday and 
at 9 a.m. the time of opening, they had you, you, just Bank of America, one bank got 85,000 small businesses asking for 22 billions in loans. So just for context, like Bank of America probably processes like less than a thousand applications like a month, maybe, maybe I don't know, like maybe 5,000, but like it, it, it's just like way bigger than they can process. Um, at the same time, US is gonna pay an, a huge amount of money just to, for two banks to distribute this money, right? Like, and this is like when, when they say loans, it's a forgivable loans, right? So, which means like literally it's giving money to these companies. So to give up 350 billion of money, they will pay 10 billion to banks. And this is like excerpt from US treasury, like uh, a different size of loan, they're gonna give different percentage to the, to the loan processor. So this just shows like a, how inefficient this thing are and like how uh, like constrained in reality is this like distribution will be. And again, part like big part of it is like there's huge demand and, and like the supply is lacking in, in, in big ways. So, I mean, we're all here in crypto. So like, how, how does this really compare with crypto? So just kind of in general, the like fiat markets are way, way bigger than like everything that, you know, in crypto we've been operating. So foreign exchange markets, which is, you know, trading pairs between USD and other, and other currencies, as well as other currencies, uh, that count for about $5 trillion of volume per day, right? And the interesting part is most of it is USD, right? 88% is USD pairs, uh, with like 20% being uh, USD Euro. So in reality, like most of the kind of wor world is really trading like back and forth between United States dollars. So gold is a good example of like, what, what is the trading volume at? It's about 145 billion, uh, obviously like fluctuates around that. Um, and then crypto, like, at, yeah, I was checking today, uh, the interesting thing that like Messari and CoinMarketCap say it's 100 billion, but then when you look at actually inside, they count twice the volume, like BTC USDT and USDT BTC is counted twice. Uh, so in reality, volume is like closer to 50 billion. Uh, and then on top of it, if you look at the, like there's this thing called real 10 volume, uh, which is a bit um, like the 10 kind of top exchanges that don't really like wash trade. Uh, the real volumes compared to like reported volumes total are kind of fraction of that, right? So for, uh, for Bitcoin, like the reported volumes are around 33 billion but like real 10 volume is only uh, 700 million and same for USDT. So in reality, like, even though, uh, like there's a lot of kind of currency, um, the kind of the actual usage of it is very small. And like, when we dig deeper, the, like the most of the usage is BTC USDT, right? Uh, as you, as you can kind of see. Like pretty much people want to deleverage their BDC uh, and then come back. Um, and this really kind of is not what we expect, you know, from some, uh, from something that, you know, would replace our, our usage of currency. So obviously stable coin is kind of like, was supposed to be an answer. At least like when I first learned about stable coin, I was like, well, this is an answer, right? Bitcoin is way too volatile. Uh, Nobody can actually use it for practical, like measure of account, but, but stable coin obviously can, uh, is, is it. So there's like a few interesting things on one side, the total market of stable coins has been growing like crazy. So there's about 170% growth year over year, uh, of stable coin. Um, so it was like total market right now at around 7.7 .7 billion. The total volume been growing as well, about 42 billion. Uh, right now, again, this is like out, out of, uh, this is without adjustment for real 10, 10 volume, but, um, and like USDT dominates the market, right? Most of it is USDT, 6.2 billion of it, uh, on the market cap and 40 billion of volume.
But the interesting question is like, how stable are the stable coins? So there's been an article by Wes Levitt uh, and uh, it analyzes like what the standard deviation actually is. And it's not that small, right? So here like it's comparison between fiat, stable coin, equity, and crypto assets. And we can see stable coins are like in 13, 15, and even sometimes higher percentages uh, on standard deviation on like volatility. And the reality is this is like, this is a pretty big difference when, you, when you're talking like actually using this for real users, right? Because a slippage of like even 1% is a additional 1% of uh, kind of value loss in the, in the transport, unless you use the stable coin as me like measure of account uh, versus just a, a kind of intermediate. Um, the interesting thing is like USD backed stable coins, such as like USDC, USDT, et cetera, they still require to buy USD, right? They, st they still create demand on USD because to expand supply, you need to buy it, right? And like as USD kind of uh, demand grows in the worldwide, right? We actually may see some like deep egging because like uh, the demand will be higher for USDT then there is like ability to buy USD globally. Uh, like in capital controlled countries like China and others, right? That's already happening, right? As I mentioned, USDT is trading a few percent higher uh, already. And I think this kind of just continue, continue growing, right? So like in reality, even what you, th what you thought would be like accessible, uh, like currency that, you know, everybody can use is still like requires to buy USD, which is like in the first place, what, what was the problem? Uh, I do want to mention like, even though DAI has like uh, good intentions, first of all, it, it is still pretty volatile. And second, the amount of it is way, way smaller, right? Like compared to like 7 billion uh, DAI right now is under hundred million of actual uh, amount, right? Uh, so again, like if, if we think of like wanting to pay somebody's salary, like as a company wanting to pay salaries in DAI, uh, just like acquire a million dollar of DAI uh, is going to like shift the market pretty dramatically and like will cost you actually a pretty like high slippage rate, right? So like, even though there's all the good intentions right now, stable coins are not there to kind of become that, right? So what is kind of current state, right? Like current state is really crypto is still used as like a trading and investment asset. And like stable coins are just used as a way to deleverage and or create lever, or create like short, sh short exposure on another crypto asset uh, without exiting crypto market, right? The like market crash that we had a few weeks ago, right? Just showcased that when everybody was like exiting, right? Everybody wanted to deleverage and de-risk and, you know, actually cash out. Uh, same happened to crypto. Like people were doing that as well. Um, and that created kind of this cascading effect that, you know, led to a lot of issues. Um, and even in countries where a large percentage is like unbacked, like people don't use crypto directly. Like, like people who do have crypto are still using it as investment asset, not as a uh, kind of day to day or even like, uh, like store of value, like a standard store of value where it is, it isn't a risky investment asset that people are, uh, kind of buying into. So like, what, like, what are the issues? What, why, why are we here? Right. One of the kind of, uh, obviously clear thing is volatility, like volatility in, you know, Bitcoin obviously like just makes it impossible to use as medium of account. But even like the stable coin is still kind of pretty hard to leverage. But even, even bigger issue, I think is actually that there is no native cost structure. Like right now there is no product or, uh, kind of, uh, like out output of some work that is natively cost costed in some cryptocurrency, right? Right now, if I, uh, kind of make some object or, um, like even write an article, right? It still costs in some kind of fiat currency. Uh, so the only thing that actually does have like uh, cost structure in crypto is kind of dApps 
and things around them. But as we all know right now, they still have very low usage. So like realistically, the first thing we need to figure out is where can we find the cost structures that are based on cryptocurrency or how do we expand the kind of stable coin market? The other side is user interfaces. I mean, they're still too complex for regular end users. I mean, it's been the improvement over like last few years been pretty dramatic, but still, you know, seed phrases, the fact that kind of the first thing you see is like, if you don't remember the, the seed phrase, you'll lose all your money. It does not really like entice kind of regular end users to, uh, to use this, right? Um, stable coins are still too nascent, right? In reality, 7 billion of currency is actually very little, right? This is like less than, I don't know, some like top, you know, fortune 500 companies having a bank. Uh, so it's not really like a, um, a clear thing that's like, oh, we can take this and start using it for, you know, some day to day, uh, trade like, uh, operations. And the other side of this is like, they're still too volatile and, and this volatility comes as like slippage on, on, on the, on your like usage. And like, again, like multiple, like few percentage of, of losing value for transactions is just too much for like for many, for many use cases, just because like on many businesses, margins are at 2%, 1%. And, uh, like if, if they're eaten up by volatility, not like, like, it's not going to be like taken uh, and used. Uh, stable coins have actually huge risk profile, even larger than other crypto. Uh, like we all know, you know, that you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum have like inherent risks, but all the stable coins have even bigger risks because first of all, they built on top of this, uh, kind of risky, uh, platforms, but then they are on top in bad either, you know, the risk of, uh, holding the fiat reserve that provides the backing or they do, you know, algorithmic trading which obviously comes in with its own risks from like Oracle pricing to um, kind of ma managing to everything, right? And again, like in Maker, we've seen the example of it a few weeks ago uh, with uh, kind of stable coin, like reserve backed with, we just know what, what are the risks there. And back to dollar, even though it provides a huge value short term, because again, dollar, like dollar actually, like from my opinion, dollar will stay strong, uh, at least like in a, sh in a short term, just because even though they're going to be printing lots of dollars, the demand around the world is still so high that people will be kind of buying it in and like everybody else is printing money as well. So like people actually will want to exit out of their local currencies into dollars anyway. But like medium term, like we know that, you know, this is unsustainable. The debt that which like US got itself into is like amazing and keeps growing. So like at some point, uh, like just pegging to a dollar is not enough. So like figuring out how to uh, like medium term, the risk from it is also important. So that was pretty fast. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll switch to discussion because I think like I'm actually interested in what people think. Um, I can like, this is mostly facts. I, I, uh, I can now kind of, uh, talk more about what I think all this means. Um, like so far, like from what I see, obviously, like there'll be a huge demand on dollars. There'll be huge kind of, uh, inflow, um, and like inflation across the world in other countries and like there'll be just not enough dollars like in many countries to to get to so th there's an opportunity for like stable coins to come in and like provide to like so, like satisfy the demand and actually give people ability to kind of uh deleverage their like local currencies position um but the point right now is it's like it's just not usable per se right like a, a normal person uh who wants to kind of transform part of their wealth into stable coin, like they will need like to go through so, so many steps and like part of which are creating like huge risks on top of them. So that like, it's unclear how like large that would be. Um, like obviously some countries who are more crypto savvy, uh, like China and Korea, I think will have like more, uh, ability, but 
uh, I'm actually interested if people see something like this happening around the world, uh, in, especially in Europe and in South America. Yeah, yeah, Mark, go yeah. ahead. So uh, I don't, I don't know how this really relates to anything per se, but I understood that the, I guess it's the physical nature of the dollars you're seeing in demand versus the virtual or used as units of account. As I understood it, China had to destroy, destroyed a fair number of physical currency and then reintroduced it into the system because they believe they believe that the virus is transmitted by a physical cash. Do you see the same scenario happen to the dollar, or is the dollar really not a physical asset that people are holding, so it doesn't really matter? Actually, in China, China most of the like like top cities and even like secondary cities have already not used cash for the last like few years. Like sure. you cannot find people with cash here in the first place. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm sure like there's some cash somewhere. So, and, and they, uh, they burn it. I think like dollar, yeah, for sure. Like the, the, the dollar, like actual bills are mostly used outside of us. I think there's actually statistics that there's more dollar bills outside of us than in us just because like, that's the way people carry dollars, um, versus like in us, we, like people use credit cards, people like bank accounts, like the banking system actually works and, uh, like it's, it's leveraged there. Um, I think like, like, I, I don't know how the, this like physical, physical piece of the, of the dollar will play out, but, uh, um, yeah, I, I don't know if like destroying, like destroying it, especially if it's like in other places will like actually, um, be happening just because like, if it's like in Ukraine, Argentina or whatever, right? Like they, they do, ha do not have ability to reprint it back. So it needs to be some kind of coordination between countries. Yeah, because at least in Austria here, they're they're basically trying to get people not to use cash. So in the, that's basically all businesses that are open. So anyways, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What what do people, sorry, what do people use instead? Like just credit cards or? Cards and then preferably contactless NFC cards. But of course, there's okay. a sizable amount of the population that doesn't have it and they're shopping for groceries and so forth. So up to this point, they haven't, it hasn't been mandated, but, uh, you know, you're, there's, there's, you know, in, when you come in the store, there's announcements over the loudspeakers, so please, please use cash. Mm -hmm. uh, please use cash. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Hey. So th thanks for, for that um, very nice summary. And I, I appreciate hearing a, a macroeconomic perspective on this. I think what, what surprised many, um, I would say crypto diehards um, was that this uh, safe haven narrative of crypto did, did not work out, at least not um, in the last weeks, right? <laughs> so when the markets crashed, um, it, it came to a, quite a surprise that, that also crypto crashed, yeah? because in a sense, some, some of the crypto heads were really like, we are using this to hedge against um, uh, such a crisis event and and to to hedge against uh, hyperinflation that that would follow on that. So I I would like to pick your brain a bit on on um, how you see this or or it do you think this narrative is completely off the table now uh, because of this or is it is it just um, uh, the markets, uh, I mean, you gave a very good um, uh, reasoning here. Yeah? So I, I would like to hear how this, how this, um, in your opinion, plays out in the medium term. Is this, is this narrative of crypto as a hedge against hyperinflation or fiat, um, is, this, is this still valid? Yeah, I mean, so that, that's, a, that's a really big question. <laughs> That's uh, probably, you know, many billion dollars question. Um, That's why I'm like, asking. <laughs> <laughs> I think like, yeah, what happens short term is like, I think dollars is right now the safe haven that everyone's kind of exited into. Uh, like as we saw the crash, like people were either exiting USDT or like directly into dollars. I think like medium term, I can like, I can see Bitcoin being a, uh, 
like a asset that like more uh, some more institutional investors will come in with the idea that uh, it will like provide them kind of decorrelated from the whole like in huge inflation that will happen with the dollars and all the other currencies. Like, and they don't need to come in like, you know, with like, oh, we're going to put like a huge portion of portfolio. They can come in with like, you know, 1% of their portfolios and that will be enough already to move Bitcoin pretty dramatically. Uh, again, like the, you know, if we're talking about $100 billion, like market cap uh, currency, if, you know, 1% of like McKenna, you know, Commonwealth, like few of these funds who are like together have $100 billion in the management, put like 1%. Uh, it's going to move pretty, pretty dramatically. So like, I can see that happening in medium term. My opinion though, we need some currency, like we need cryptocurrency, which is actually like st can be stable is initially packed to dollar, but like kind of deviates from it in a longer term. So like, that's what I've been, I've been thinking about is like, what, what does that would look like, which would, uh, kind of provide a like this like short term satisfaction to the demand with like something that's like directly uh, like dollar pa pegged, but then over time actually decouples from dollar as dollar becomes uh, like more and more inflated and uh, demand drops over time. Um, like, I don't know exactly how that would look like, but I think if, if something like this comes to play and it's like has a, you know, user interface people can use, you know, uh, you know, has an easy mobile app. You can just scan, you know, QR code. Uh, like, you know, what's better than uh, cards and cash is like, you know, just a QR code scanner, like no touching whatsoever, um, like no way to transmit anything. So, and like in China, for example, like that's what I was saying, like in China is actually like completely like not using cash anymore and just scanning QR codes everywhere uh, for paying. Um, so like, I think that is where like we can actually bring something to the table. And then with that, like there's a reasonable opportunity to actually give, like be able to give loans as well to people through this kind of uh, machinery as well. Um, so I don't know, I mean, that, that's kind of what I'm thinking. I'd like, I don't know how it all, like how it all plays together. And if there is a good model like that in the first place, um, but like unless we actually have something that's like not not limited by like by volume capacity like Dai, and at the same time is not like requires you to deposit dollars into the you know into some bank because like that means you're still creating demand for dollars. You're not solving the original problem of like uh, satisfying dollar demand. Like finding something in the middle. Um, like if we can get that, that will probably like become a more used, like better safe ha ha haven uh, in like short term for like the third world countries. And then if it can decorrelate from dollar in the medium term, uh, can also flock kind of investments from, from everywhere else. Thank you. Um, if, if I may and not take up too much uh, space here, um, following up on this. so. First, um, the original vision for, for DAI, uh, the MakerDAO uh, stablecoin, was to be pegged to, to a basket of currencies, right? So the, mm -hmm. the, the, the pegging to the USD was basically a, a temporary um, pragmatic solution. So maybe, maybe we will see that. Um, and the, the other comment on this, don't you think that monetary policy comes into play at some point? So in, in a sense, if you, I mean, if you believe in, let's say, um, Austrian economics, um, th people want harder currencies, right? In, in terms of crisis. Uh, and, and if we have uh, fiat currencies with, with tons of liquidity pumped into the markets, um, don't you think that the demand for, for harder currencies with stricter monetary policies that are independent of, of political um, favors uh, that the demand uh, would rise for such uh, harder cryptocurrencies with a um, fixed supply? Uh, I think, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I think like it will rise somewhat, but it still will be an investment 
asset, not a uh, kind of something that people use as like a like kind of general store value, right? Okay. Like you still you still really assign a huge risk to it versus um, if you think of like do- like dollars in terms of like in terms of crisis in other countries, you think of dollars as safe haven, right? You exit into it and you kind of decorrelate yourself from the economy. Uh, like, I don't think that that is happening with the current cryptocurrencies, even with like kind of this, you know, not controlled monetary policy, just because you cannot go and buy, like you cannot go to the store and buy stuff. Like the, the, the price of the stuff is not denominated in that. Like with dollars, you can go and buy stuff in dollars, things denominated in dollar prices. Thank you. Yeah, also like I, I like the basket of currency approach, right? There's uh, SRD stuff, but um, like the thing is like everyone's right now will be actually inflating their currency, right? So it's unclear if basket of currency is actually the, the solution here. Like I, I actually don't know. I'm, I've, I haven't looked too much in like how baskets behave over time. Any other questions? Yeah, you hear me? Yeah. So uh, you made the distinction between uh, the volume shown by the exchanges and the real volume. Um, how, how can you determine the real volume? Yeah, that's a good question. The way the specific metric that I looked at uh, determines it, there is this report uh, published which like showcases uh different exchanges and how um like how they pretty much like create fake volume or like what like their fake volume and then identify a set of exchanges which do not do that or at least it doesn't look like they're doing that and so misari uses that set of exchanges which is coinbase kraken binance and like a few more uh to kind of create this like real 10 volume index um i can is it chat here no uh i can link it in discord um and uh like that that is pretty much like it's probably not the full volume there's some volume happening on other exchanges but it kind of removes a lot of this noise that um definitely is there for like there's a lot of small exchanges which say they're trading more bitcoin for example than like Coinbase and Binance. And it's just like, obviously not true, right? 